I realise that there um, we have a few non-Merit Club members here today. And for those of you who have not met with yet, I'm Christina, I'm the founder of the Merit Club, a club which is a, basically a club for women who want more from life and want to connect with incredible women. Um, so we run obviously online events and in-person events where we can, not right now. So I'm so, so I'm very excited about, about oh, I can hear my voice hear now. My voice. Is my no, microphone is going on? You're okay for me. Okay, I will for everyone else because I just totally heard myself talking. Anyway, this is just going to be one of those webinars. So um, we're going to talk about nutrition, meditation and the mind. Um, and we're also going to include the science behind it, which is exciting. So I'm joined by the wonderful Kate Carey today, um, a holistic health coach and nutritionist. And um, Kate's work is around connecting you to health and purpose and specializing in plant-based nutrition, burnout, and women's health. So it's going to be a great event, uh, packed full of tips and valuable information for you to take away. So make sure you have a pen and paper ready. Uh, we planned, I think we, it's gonna be an hour, um, 45 minute, an hour um, sort of session. And um, obviously if you have any comments, questions, anything, just submit it in the uh, either the Q&A or the chat box and just feel free to interact and, and talk. Uh, I'll keep my eye on the chat as well. So I'm super excited and I hope you're gonna enjoy it, ladies. Over to you, Kate. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And um, I'm just going to share my screen and share the presentation. And I, I don't, I don't believe that I see the, the chat. So um, I'll just keep, keep an eye on things as we go through as well. So and so today, I'm, I'm so, so happy to be here and, and really, um, Thank you so much for your time and your presence today. And I'll be covering nutrition and meditation and the effect that that has on the brain. And in terms of um, a little bit about me, um, Christina really nicely introduced me, so thank you. And I look at nutrition from a holistic point of view, so kind of mind, body, soul, and um, qualified in women's health coaching as well. And really my um, the way I approach things is having a... Um, positive relationship with food and health and also to really support sustainable change and today was really about helping everybody understand how important nutrition is for the mind but also meditation and some of the science behind that and I think we could all agree in the times we're in right now supporting our mental health is is super important um, so hopefully you'll get some of that from today I tend to move through quite quickly um, and so we can have a bit more interaction at the end. And then I'm really happy to share slides too, because I do put a fair bit of information in the slides. So do let me know if you want anything from there. And sort of, I really like to start with, um, you know, what nutrition is, because it can mean different things to different people. And there's the scientific view versus kind of by a more holistic view, but it's really nutrition's about how um, animals or plants, how we how we and they take in and, and utilize the food. So from a scientific level, it's all about how the food is processed and used throughout the body and it's very chemical in nature. And from my point of view, nutrition is not just about food, it's about nutrition for the mind, for the soul, and great health needs a balance between mind, body and spirit. And as part of that, we need nutrients, we need food to make the enzymes that our body needs to break down the food we take in to really build the cell structures to allow our body to produce energy, you know, bone, blood, everything um, in our body needs nutrition. And as part of that, the brain is a really, really, really big deal. And why? Because it's our control centre. It means that our heart will keep beating on its own. Um, we can breathe. Our lungs will do everything they need to do. And we need our brain functioning um, peak in peak performance so we can think, move and feel. And food plays such a significant role in 
keeping our brain healthy, we, it's so, so important for um, mental tasks, for our memory, for concentrating. And the brain uses so much energy about, you know, actually it's over 20% of the body's energy is consumed by the brain. And, and I don't know if any of you have ever sort of, when you've been studying or, you know, doing something that takes a lot of brain power, you can actually get really, really quite hungry. Um, I certainly noticed that when I was, um, you know, at uni and doing different things, you get um, really hungry because the body uses, the brain uses a lot of energy. And just to touch on a bit of the science, the way um, I'll move through some of the slides and information is just kind of, okay, let's learn a bit about the brain, the foods that are not helpful. And then I like to end with what we can do. Um, so we're really having that healthy relationship with food and supporting ourselves. Um, and so I just wanted to touch on the hippocampus, which is a sea, it's a seahorse shaped part of the brain. It's um, a primitive part. It is really key in forming memories, organizing, storing information. So we really need that to learn new things so that we can regulate our emotions. Um, and it also plays a really important role in spatial navigation so that's sort of how we um we perceive um everything around us and uh there was a doctor that i was um getting a lot of my um, research and information from when when putting this together and the hippocampus part of our brain is so critical for memory and it's really sensitive to insult so by different environmental factors things like you know toxins and pollution but also eating foods that are high in things like um, saturated fat or high in processed sugar. And um, apologies, the slides keep skipping forward too. I think technology is not my friend today. Um, but in terms of um, the brain itself and getting into a bit of the science, I wanted to really look at, give you a look at brain scans and what the brain is like on sugar. And what you can see over on the right is brain scans of a normal brain, um, a brain that um, of someone that's been taking cocaine and then the brain of someone that's obese. And really, this is just to help me illustrate the point about the brain on sugar. And sugar is as addictive as cocaine. And, and the reason um, it does that is because it stimulates a release in dopamine um, in the receptors and we can build up tolerance. So the scans you see on the right, the normal brain, the red that you can see is actually um, healthy dopamine levels. And on the right, to the right of those, you can see where dopamine has been depleted. So sugar behaves in the brain similar to those two scans on the right. So if we over consume sugar, we get a dopamine hit and we need more and more. And that's what tolerance really is. So High consumption of sugar in lots of studies has been shown to cause things like anxiety, um, dementia, Alzheimer's, learning difficulties leading on to depression. So you can see um, how detrimental a huge amount of sugar can be to how our brain functions and performs. And then the next, there's just two, two other things to cover off with just food and the impact on the brain to understand, you know, some of the, the negative things that can happen as a result of diet. And then we've got loads of nice, great things that we can do to support the brain with food. Um, and so something, um, something else you may have heard of is trans fats and the um, World Health Organization, their report back in 2009 actually declared trans fats as toxics and, and some, some countries ban them. Um, unfortunately, the UK don't and also Australia doesn't either. Although the amount of trans fat in our foods has been significantly reduced, it's still there. And a trans fat, just to kind of keep it simple, is um, oils or fats that have been um, modified in a way to preserve the shelf life of something like cookies and cakes or um, you know, processed foods, um, kind of those long life muffins you might find in a service station, that kind of thing. And the reason we they're not good for us is that the trans fat has been modified in processing to um, 
a molecular form that the body doesn't recognize, you can't process it properly and it causes inflammation. So it's the sort of fake fats, I suppose, they lead to things like um, obesity, type two, type two diabetes, things like cardiovascular disease as well. And then again, why, why does that matter for the brain? Well, it's associated with depression, um, anxiety, memory problems, you know, feeling even irritable and aggressive. And, you know, just kind of one and a half grams a day has been shown to increase depression in studies by 48%. Um, and the, the, the flip side of that, a benefit is that having um, healthy unsaturated oils like olive oils or even eating olives um, lowers that risk by 30%. And trans fats, um, as I mentioned, are in foods that kind of have long shelf life. So it's the heavily processed things like yeah, the, the cookies and um, some of the snack bars and um, muffins and, and baked goods and things like that, that or even like kind of like highly fried um, processed foods. So that's just something to be mindful of. And then the last thing I wanted to touch on just in terms of um, the brain and some of the things that are not so supportive is our brain on grain. And really with gluten-free, it's, it's not really a, a fad or, or something when you age. It's a diet that we consisted or consumed um, many, many years ago. Wheat and gluten is a relatively new thing. And there's about 55 diseases that are related to consuming high levels of gluten, things like anxiety, dementia, migraines. We're even seeing um, children with um, ADHD and autism that are quite affected by consuming gluten. And there's a couple of reasons. Gluten contains something called glutamate, and we, we actually need that. Um, however, having too much of it is damaging to brain cells, it, it can become something called an exotoxin. And it also triggers the release of something called zonulin, which is a substance that loosens the tight junctions in the gut. Um, so it increases the permeability of the gut lining. And the reason that we don't want that is we want really nice tight junctions in the gut so that our food can be completely broken down um, and digested before it crosses the um, barrier into the lymphatic system. So fats go into the lymphatic system and everything else goes into the blood and to the liver. And gluten loosens those junctions that we want to keep nice and tight. And, and when the junctions are loose, it allows undigested food to cross into our um, system, which causes inflammation. And I'm not um, a, a huge kind of have everything gluten-free um, supporter it's just about kind of balance and being mindful which I'm going to touch on next so the the issue comes from things like overproduction of wheat so the wheat has really high levels of gluten now and often we are consuming just way too much so if you have um, breakfast cereal with that's gluten uh, then you have lunch, you might have a sandwich or a wrap, and then you have pasta for dinner, and maybe your snacks are full of gluten too. It's just too much through the day. And then, you know, there are other kind of options that are generally well supportive, like um, grains like spelt, much lower in gluten, and things like a really great sourdough that doesn't have any yeast added that's been fermented and... Um, allowed to prove over time and, and be baked kind of the old fashioned way can actually be really supportive of gut health. Um, you know, unless you've got celiac disease or a, another um, condition where you can't have gluten, I think in small amounts, it's okay, but it's just kind of balance. And I, I'd like to say the same with trans fats and sugars is that sugar in moderation in fruits and, you know, some sugar here and there is fine. And, and some processed food with trans fats is okay, but it's just, balancing out what we have in our diet. So now I want to get onto the fun part, which is brain food and the foods that we can have that really support um, our gut health, which has a knock-on effect to our, um, our mood and, and kind of how we uh, learn and, and memorize things. And so really the first area to cover is um, great fats. And 
I, I like um, the term fat heads because literally we are about 60% of our dry brain weight is made up of um, DHA fat and it's so important that we have omega-3s. Um, we need omega-3, 6 and 9, we need all of them, um, but it tends that our Western diet is very high in omega-6, so we, we generally get enough of that and not enough um, omega-3. So you, you want to look out for um, things like wild salmon, uh, fish like mackerel, trout, but if you're vegan or vegetarian, then um, things like um, walnuts are fantastic. Spinach is great. Also flax seeds, kale and walnuts. I actually love because they're, they're even shaped like little grains. And um, you'll often find the nutrition foods that are shaped like certain parts of the body are actually supportive of that area. So um, kidney beans look like little kidneys and they're actually really supportive of kidney health. And, um, Omega-3s are, are really important, important for um, women who are pregnant. Um, if there's not enough omega-3s coming in, um, the children can often be at risk of nerve problems and um, vision development can be impaired as well. So um, omega-3s are really, really important to have in the diet. And again, and again, it's kind of like you don't have to overdo this. It's just about seeing in your daily life or over your week how you can integrate some of these things in maybe a handful of walnuts with some apple as a snack or um, you know some wild salmon and greens um, uh, for your evening meal um, just kind of adding in over time to get those nutrients in and you know why kind of some more reasons why do we want omega-3s um, and in terms of you know, how do we help the brain with those? And really omega-3s help with our cell membranes and help build those. So that reduces inflammation, which means we have um, a reduction in things like Alzheimer's, depression, autism, ADHD, because inflammation causes a lot of those um, challenges and we're seeing them on the rise today, especially with things like Alzheimer's and dementia. And that's something quite close to home for me. Um, uh, a good friend's mum just passed from Alzheimer's last week and, and my dad's partner is in the home with it as well. And it's just very debilitating. And there are things we can do now to really um, look after our health as we age. So we age feeling healthy and well. Um, Omega-3s help us balance our blood sugar, which is essential for a healthy brain and for feeling alert and having energy. Um, it increases something called BDNF, um, that stands for brain-derived neurotropic factor, and this um, stimulates new cell growth and increased cell connection, and also exercise does this as well. So particularly HIIT um, exercise or high, your high intensity also stimulates BDNF, which is really, really great for um, getting those new connections going. And we also want omega-3s because they help us learn they help us with our memory and like I'd mentioned on the previous slide they're super important for um, development of young brains and oxidative stress is something um, I'm sort of touching on here in um, two ways I know I put trans fats and gluten and sugar earlier as kind of issues and oxidative stresses as well but it's also something that um, goes hand in hand with antioxidants, which I'm sure you've all heard of, but maybe not heard of something called free radicals, which cause the oxidative stress. So essentially what, um, how free radicals are formed and what they are and what oxidative stress is, is that as the body is carrying out all of its normal um, processes, um, breaking down food, um, when we're exercising, all of the cellular respiration is creating free radicals by the chemical um, reactions that are taking place. And a free radical is really um, a molecule that has um, lost an electron and it's unstable. And if it's floating around the body unstable, it's causing inflammation. And what antioxidants do is they are able to give an electron to the free radical, stabilizing that molecule. And the antioxidant doesn't actually become unstable by letting an electron go. So essentially, when a free radical um, 
picks up an electron from an antioxidant, the chain reaction of the free radical stops there. So we reduce um, a lot of sickness, disease and aging by having lots of antioxidants. And if we don't, then we're at risk of things like heart disease, of cancer, of um, brain and nervous system conditions. And again, Alzheimer's, you're gonna see these kind of recurring themes throughout. And the great thing with oxidative stress is that it's actually really, um, really, really simple to decrease that and to boost the body's natural defences and get that cellular nu nu nutrition at really optimal levels. And over three months of continued attention and love and nourishment on our nutrient levels, we can restore them to optimal levels. And what I love about antioxidants is that there are, there are four main antioxidants that we can get in the diet um, that are just so, so, so um, happy for the body and happy for the brain. And those are the ones on the right. And you can see things like vitamin C and vitamin E, uh, something, a mineral called selenium, and then beta carotene. And uh, vitamin C is amazing for uh, immune health, especially at this time, especially in the Northern Hemisphere with the winter. And because it's water soluble, we need that every day. We can get it in supplement form. Um, I recommend really high dose, like a thousand milligram um, supplements, but also in citrus fruits, in um, peppers are great, red peppers, really high in um, vitamin C. Also things you might not think of like kiwi fruit and kale and broccoli, also really high in vitamin C and also strawberries. Um, and selenium is um, like a wonder mineral, not really talked about as much as things like zinc and magnesium, but uh, things like Brazil nuts are fantastic. Um, oats are amazing. Oats are great for brain health and heart health. Uh, brown rice as well, broccoli and spinach, amazing for, for that mineral. And selenium is amazing because it's required for proper function of some of the enzymes that the body um, produces that breaks down on food so we can use it. So it's important that we take in the right food, but that we can also um, assimilate that and, and the body is able to actually use it. Um, vitamin E is a fat-soluble vitamin, so we don't need it in as higher doses because fat-soluble just means the body can store that. And so things like nuts and seeds are fantastic. Um, I would recommend things like olive oils. Um, fish oils are great too. Whole grains and apricots are um, particularly high in vitamin E. And in terms of um, olive oil, if you don't like olive oil, but you actually like olives, olives are also a fantastic um, alternative to nuts. If you're allergic to nuts or seeds, you can have olives instead. And then beta carotene is also um, one of the main four antioxidants. And you can get that through egg yolk, through um, organic butter, um, but if you're vegan, there's lots of options here. There's lots of veggie options. Tomato is amazing. Um, things like peaches and carrots, squash as well. You'll see, you can see kind of a theme there with the orange um, fruits and vegetables that are just really, really supportive for the body and the brain and to help that oxidative stress to reduce that. And then um, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the minerals that are really important for brain health. Um, I've put, you know, quite a bit of info on here and, and this is sort of, you know, if people want the slides after to refer back to, you've got the information. And really um, zinc and magnesium is super important for um, metabolizing omega-3s and what that means is that we can actually use them. So again, it's to the point of, okay, we can eat it, but we need to be able to support the body to use them. Um, so zinc and magnesium help with that process. It helps the enzymes, um, the enzyme reactions inside the brain. And if you don't know what an enzyme is, it's sort of like a catalyst. It's um, If we didn't have enzymes, it would take an eternity to break something down. So enzymes start, we have enzymes in the mouth and in the gut and all through our system that really allow food to be broken down super fast and used by the body. And so it's really important that we support those enzymes in that process. And there's a lot, a lot of studies on zinc and magnesium, but low zinc um, has been shown um, to 
cause depressive symptoms and really the lower the zinc levels, the greater the level of depression. And um, individuals with ADHD, there's a lot of study going on there now, um, tend to have 30% lower than the standard in terms of zinc levels. Magnesium is also super important. Um, magnesium is leached by too much alcohol, too much salt, things like coffee, sugar, soda, antibiotics, and low levels of magnesium, again, have been implicated in mood disorders, um, in suicide and depression. And um, the, I would say it's really great to supplement with a, with a multi-mineral if you're feeling that you may be depleted or in, in need of boosting your mood. And the reason that we're often low in these minerals is because our um, soils have been over farmed. Um, I think the organic farms are doing a good job now of rotating crops and putting that nutrition back in, but we've got a long way to go with um, over farming and over production. And, and as the longer um, food takes to get from um, being harvested to your table, um, the nutrient levels decrease. So it's always great to kind of look at where you might need to supplement. Um, the great sources um, from the diet, I've listed some here. Um, leafy greens are great. Um, pumpkin seeds, amazing source of zinc. Um, oatmeal comes up over and over again. Um, oats also have a, a really great uh, fibre called beta-glucan, which helps um, get the system moving and, and get toxins out. So I've just listed some foods that you can you can bring in and you can see a theme running throughout with the foods too. And it's really sort of about balancing. And, and I do also try um, to really help people with various diets because some people, I mean, a lot more people are vegan these days. So you can really lean into the, um, the pulses, the beans, the nuts, um, the greens. Um, some of the greens powders these days are really fantastic as well. And vitamin D, this is a big one, a big one for the brain. I think we, we all know that when we're in the sun and we've got sun on our skin that we feel happier. And in the northern hemisphere, vitamin D levels are generally lower. Um, I would always recommend getting those levels checked when you can and taking a supplement in, in the northern hemisphere for sure. Around four to 800 IU is, um, as a supplement, has shown to really improve mood during the winter months. And that was with some quite intense studies. And good vitamin D levels have shown to have a real positive effect on our attention, um, how enthusiastic we feel, how motivated we are, um, how alert we are as well. And when there's vitamin D deficiency, we obviously have low energy. Um, our cognition just isn't as good and we can often kind of just start to get a bit forgetful. Um, in terms of sources, really, um, you're looking at things like egg yolk, salmon, sardines, cod liver oil, mushrooms is the really the only vegan um, option that has high levels. Um, the mushrooms absorb the, the um, vitamin D um, from the sunlight, but really uh, vitamin C is actually, vitamin D, sorry, is, is actually made on the skin in the sunlight and then absorbed into the skin. So um, a little tip actually too is when you are in the sun to try not to wash too soon after you've been in the sun so that the skin has time to absorb um, the vitamin D uh, that you get. And then gut health. Um, I really did need to put this in here because our gut health is so important for our brain health. And um, I don't know how many of you know, it's starting to get a lot of coverage now, the microbiome and um, bacteria and all that kind of thing. And it's said that we're only 10% human. Um, we've got more bacteria on us than we do human or more bacterial cells than human cells. And um, we're outnumbered on a ratio of about 10 to one. With each human gene, we have about 360 microbial ones. And many of those live in the digestive, digestive tract. And that's why gut health is so important. And um, our our gut bacteria influence our mood. They're, they're even said to influence who we're attracted to. And the brain is very sensitive to changes in gut bacteria in terms of the central nervous system and the nervous system and, and the bi-directional communication that's going from the gut to the brain and, get, and back again. So often it's said that the gut is in charge of the brain and kind of has, a, um, has its 
uh, its hands on the steering wheel. So a healthy gut is what makes it possible to have clear conscious thoughts. And, you know, if you think about it, when you're kind of um, down in the dumps, you you really need to address your gut health. Um, so if you, if you want your brain to function better, pay attention to your gut. And the next slide actually gives you lots of things you can do to support your gut health. And the, the brain and the gut are always sending messages to each other. So, you know, if you're stressed, you can um, sometimes get an upset or queasy tummy. Uh, and the other way around, if you've got lots of digestive issues, you, you can make you feel quite stressed. And, you know, our serotonin, that kind of feel good um, hormone is produced in the gut. Our immune system primarily resides in the gut as well. It's about 70%. Um, so super important to look after our gut health in terms of how well we function mentally. And this side is really looking about, okay, well, that's great. Um, how can we actually feed our bugs? And I just really want to um, drive home the point that anyone can change the state of their microbiome through dietary and lifestyle choices. And it can just be one step at a time, one day at a time. I'm such a big, um, a big promoter of that, um, that you can slowly make these changes. So you can start to look at, okay, what kind of fiber rich foods can I get into my diet? Um, things like vegetables, fruit. Um, we don't need to be afraid of, of things like fruit. They're full of minerals, vitamins, um, fiber, phytonutrients. Um, things like fermented vegetables are amazing. Um, and yogurt is, is another great one as well if you're, if you're not vegan. And I, and I really always like to promote um, organic choices if you're um, if you're going to have dairy. Um, also things like wild fish are really, really good, really great quality proteins. Um, coconut oils are wonderful to support um, our gut bugs. And then something that might make many of you very happy, enjoying wine, tea and coffee in moderation also is, is really, um, can be really supportive. Um, they all contain something called polyph polyphenols, which are super powerful antioxidants found in plants that support gut bacteria. And um, something I learned when I was um, in India is that they serve food on the leaves, the banana leaves. And the reason they do that is because the heat of the food releases polyphenols from the banana leaves that are infused into the food. So, um, it's just so interesting when you visit different cultures and you see how they naturally prepare and serve foods to enhance the nutritional levels and feed the good gut bacteria. And there's been a few studies of some really interesting tribes as well around the world. And they're so healthy because of the amount of fiber um, and plant-based fibers that they have in their diet. So just something to consider about feeding your bugs um, in your gut for a healthy mind. And this, this slide, I'm, I'm not going to read through everything um, on the right, but it's really just about um, helping you understand that the brain needs quality food and that we need all these different vitamins and minerals to support us and that each of them play a role. So, you know, um, we, I think we all know a lot, okay, B12 is great for energy and um, clarity and making, making us kind of cognitively um we function but um, we need vitamin E the fat soluble vitamin to protect the membranes um, of our cells we need iron to supply oxygen to the brain uh, and the nerve coatings and the nerve chemicals in the brain um, we need the omega-3s again for thinking and visual development and vitamin b6 makes um, brain tram transmitters too and um and also, you know, it's not about getting complicated. It's just about, okay, how can I add some things in from um, my previous slides to try to start to balance things out? And even if that's like one new meal a week you add in and over time you build that up, you'll start to increase your levels of these nutrients. And if you can do that over a few months, you get to those optimal levels and you just start to feel um, a lot more with it, a lot sharper, and you start to feel a lot better in the morning as well. And so kind of coming to the end of a good diet and, and changes in the brain before I talk a little about the meditation part is that, you know, why would we want to do all of this? Why make the effort? And 
it's because then we, we have more brain cells, we have stronger connections, faster communication between the brain and the brain cells. There's more blood flow coming, more glucose, more oxygen, um, faster repair. And, you know, that's also wonderful when we're going through challenging times or we want to change behaviours and patterns. We really need our brain working really well to support um, what we want to do in our life. So a good diet changes the brain. And, um, and I, do, I do like the visuals um, I was able to grab for this one in terms of, you know, as you decide what to eat at your next meal, um, maybe you could look at that a little differently. Think about feeding your mind um, all those beautiful, colourful, rich, um, really delicious foods that can really feed your feed your mind and help you feel happy and well and, and happy as you age through life as well. And the next um, bit, I'm just going to move into um, meditation now, this, this section shorter. Just to cover off, really what meditation is and there's a little bit of the science behind it so again I think it's always helpful to have the knowledge to understand the why behind something why it's good for us can often help motivate us to take some action or integrate it into our life and um, I don't uh, in here tell you who to go and meditate with or kind of how to do that because I personally think it's a, it's a very personal choice. Um, I've been studying with someone called Joe Dispenza for about 10 years now. I enjoy his style of meditation. Um, so I just encourage you if this next peak bit piques your interest, resonates with you, just go and try some things out because um, some people like guided, some like um, quiet, um, or kind of more mindfulness space where you focus on different parts of your body or kind of walking meditations. There's lots of different types, but they all, the wonderful thing is that they all have the same um, positive effects at the end of, end of the day. So why a meditation? What is it? There's lots of different um, definitions to it. It's really difficult to find one, even if you go and search um, definitions, it's, they're, they're all very different. So um, one quite common one is that it's really the practice of becoming familiar with oneself. Um, I think we've all probably heard that it's about kind of about stilling the mind. Um, sometimes it's not even about that. It's just about letting the thoughts flow through. Um, but it is often about bringing peace, bringing calmness, bringing connectedness, um, and as you progress it then, it, then it can sort of become, okay, a state of consciousness where we, we are free um, of thought um, and that we end up with patterns where we can have a state of mind where we just feel clear, coherent, aligned, kind of at one. And I'll talk about a little study in here in a minute where, you know, people in the group that were studied were feeling these kind of really clear elated feelings and and why would we want to do it what's the benefit in terms of our mental health well it helps us with anxiety um, with stress with medical challenges that we might have and and often it's not even about finding a solution or fixing ourselves or anything but changing our perspective on something and often changing our perspective solves the solves the problem at times and um, also just changing our perspective can reduce anxiety, depression and those kinds of things. And the great scientific part is that regular practice actually rewires the brain. So we can rewire our mind to better able manage challenges in our life. And what happens with meditation over time is that we rewire new neural pathways for relaxation, for calm. And the more we wire those new patterns the less the old patterns that we run um, can take up space. They, they really start to wither away. And something that's used in meditation and neuroscience is that um, brain cells that fire together, wire together. So the more we're wiring helpful behaviours, the, um, the more the old ones um, really just don't have space anymore. And so... I wanted to just touch a bit more on the benefits because I just love being able to see, okay, 
in terms of the benefits, this is why I want to do this. And there's physical, spiritual, mental benefits, which relates back to nutrition for mind, body and soul. And, you know, physically, why would we want to do this? Well, meditation helps normalise blood pressure. Even just meditative breathing helps with that. We can also reverse disease through meditation, lower our resting heart rate, reduce our stress chemicals and anxiety. Um, your skin even starts to glow after a while. And once we can start to become more relaxed, our mood improves, our memory improves, and we start to have this like, kind of spiritual ability to connect with who we are, I guess sort of our higher self. We can often get insights um, through meditation. And mentally, I think this is kind of the big one and related to the topic today. So mentally, meditation helps with stress, with uh, insomnia, um, poor memory, uh, anxiety, again, depression, um, helps considerably with things like panic attacks. And also if you're kind of really moody and irritable. Um, so these are some of the amazing benefits. And then I just have a few slides to show you some of the science and um, also just to explain again a bit about the brain and how it works. And the brain's an electrochemical organ. It uses electromagnetic energy to function. And it's the same across men, women, children, anyone of any culture. It crosses all boundaries. It's just part of the human condition. And the four brainways that I um, cover here are something you might have heard of before. Um, and this is how meditation is measured through um, either beta, alpha, theta or delta waves. And just as a kind of an overview, beta is sort of um, more cycles per second. And, and beta would be if you were, um, for example, you're on this um, presentation today and perhaps you're really interested in it and you, you want to take notes and you want to learn. So you'll be in beta. Um, or if someone, you might have gone into something and, and thought you're not getting tested on, on a particular thing and then the person or lecturer or teacher says, and at the end of this, you're going to have a quiz. And then you might have been in alpha kind of daydreaming and then you, you go up to beta. And so as the brain waves slow down, um, the cycles slow down. So when you get to alpha, you're kind of more relaxed, you're you know, not really in an aroused state. Um, you'd be moving into meditation, into hypnosis perhaps. And then as we go further down through things like theta waves, that's when you really be, you know, very day, you know, daydreaming state or you might be doing something super creative. Don't know if you've ever had those times where you've engaged in something you love and then, I don't know, hours go by and you don't even know what happened or the sunset or something like that. You you probably could even be down in theta. Um, this is where out-of-body experiences happen. Um, things like ESP, like extrasensory perception, um, where you might kind of think of something and then it happens or think of someone and they call. Um, and then delta is really when we're in deep, dreamless state, sleep. Um, and so the next slide, you don't need to be able to read what's on um, the graph because that's kind of what I've just talked through. But this is just to show you visually how the brain waves slow down. And gamma I haven't covered today because that's kind of a super heightened state um, where meditators, once they go plus delta, can then actually shoot into this gamma phase where they're hyper aroused, but they're completely, um, completely asleep. But in terms of meditation and why... Um, it's important and the impact on the brain. A lot of studies with groups of meditators, um, as they meditate over time, the theta brain waves become prominent. And when they're in that um, phase, this is where people start to um, experience things like complete mental stillness and silence. They start to talk about things like oneness with the present moment and this activity suggests that structures within the brain, the limbic system, are being activated by meditation. And the limbic system is um, where the hypothalamus is that I was talking about earlier that we want to support with good food um, that's responsible for memory, um, storing information, um, learning new things. And that limbic system is responsible for lots of aspects of um, our emotions and mood. 
And what this is really illustrating is that moving into meditation helps the brain really um, connect into those states that help us with our brain health and our mental health. And all forms, as I mentioned before, whatever type you like, they're associated with inner calm, blissful states. And this side, we've only got a few left, um, just in case you're wondering, you know, how we're going with this. But this one is really just to, not to kind of over complicate or confuse with the images on the right. It's more if you want to have them um, in detail than at another time. But so how, you know, how does this all work with meditation? Like how is this actually calming our brain down and working on a scientific level? And it's really the relationship between the amygdala and more primitive part of the brain and the prefrontal cortex. And what you'll see um, with meditation in the theta brain waves is actually um, calming all the brain waves around the front and through the middle of the brain. And the amygdala part of the brain, it kind of decides if we're angry or anxious, it's older, it, um, it's, it's kind of um, a rapid split second um, response. It's our fight or flight area of the brain. If a tiger's there, it activates and makes us jump out the way before we've got time to think. There's no time for thinking then. And whereas the prefrontal cortex, it's really about stop and think about things, analyze and plan. It takes a long time. Um, to make decisions and we need both but often in our modern lives we've the amygdala is turned on all the time and we're reacting and we're in stress when we don't need to be and so why is meditation so um so good for this and, and the images on the side are just showing you where um, meditation is um activating um something called the prefrontal cortex and it meditation increases the activity in the left prefrontal cortex and that is that area that's associated with um, something called metacognition thinking about thinking um, positivity feeling good um, concentration planning and depression is linked with decreased activity in that region or dominant activity in the right prefrontal cortex so um what meditation does by increasing the activity in the left front, left free prefrontal cortex, it decreases the activity in the right side, allowing us to access that ability to concentrate, to plan, to feel good um, and reduces depression. And the amazing thing with meditation is if the, it's something that you do consistently over time, it becomes more stable and we could, you can even stop meditating for a little while and you still have the beneficial effects. So, again, I always like to talk about balance and having healthy relationships with food and our health. And it's not about being dogmatic or um, over the top about meditating every day. It's about what can work for you that you can build up over time. And you can have a few days off and that's fine and you'll still get those um, beneficial effects of meditation. So I just wanted to leave you with this last slide in that um, you know try meditation I really encourage you to do that it is free it can be free you can pay for programs but you can also find so much now that is free um, and it's now being recognized that um, stress is a major contributor to disease and that um, something like meditation is such a, a simple stress management technique, I suppose, and it's really helpful for all kinds of things. So um, thank you so much for tuning in um, and listening. And I'm just going to stop the share because I can't see if there are any comments or questions. Um, that thank was you. I, thank you so much. It was so there. comprehensive. It was just, I love um, doing events with you. We did, we actually, ladies, um, just before I forget, we did one in August as well about self-care and it was brilliant as well. If you want to watch it, it's in the members area for my club members, um, the replays in there. So that was also, you know, amazing as this one. So thank you so much, Kate. I really, really loved it. Um, and then I think um, Sion was asking if uh, we'd love to have the slides. I'm not sure if that is something that you um, want to share or um, it's, it's actually recorded. So if anyone wants to actually um, watch the replay, then, you know, you have the slides there. But um, I wonder if anyone had any yeah, questions. 
Any questions? And I was going to say, you can just people can feel free to reach out to me as well um, if they need. My website's kcarenutrition.com, but if people just want to drop me an email um, to ask for any of the information, because I know it can be a bit kind of, oh, my God, like, what did she put up there? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of information. Or yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Like, but still. Uh, I'm happy to share those. Yeah, no, we can also do that. And you have your and you have your who wants to follow you. Um and they can look at any of that if that's easier, less than easier. Yeah, and I think I think it's and hopefully the um technology was okay because we, we had quite a few troubles with me getting on and we sound and connecting. So hopefully it was okay. Um, yeah, I mean Throughout, um, I don't know about you ladies, but I had a, you know, a bit of a, a trouble with uh, with sound and things like that. So I'm not sure if it was mine. It was great. Yeah, oh, great. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it must be my connection on my on my end. So I'm, I'm very happy that, that if that's the case. Um, but yeah, we're going to say it was great. Thank you. Yeah, um, I really enjoyed it as always. And uh, I loved having you ladies here. I hope you found it valuable as well.